The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said to the disciple, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had been given the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you made it over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have taken my money and invested it with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. When I was a little kid, every single family gathering always included a show. My first cousins, who were four and two years uh, older than me, along with my younger sister, who is now my middle sister, but the youngest one hadn't been born yet, the four of us would put our heads together and we would figure out something that we could act out, something that we could do, we could sing, we could dance, we would come up with something, and we'd get excited about it. So we'd make programs. We'd make costumes. We would make tickets. We would give the tickets to our parents. Our parents would lose the tickets. (laughs) And we would make more tickets. So happy were we to eventually put on our show. So proud we were to demonstrate just how talented we were. And as far as we were concerned, we were. Now, no one had iPhones at the time, and any camcorder evidence that might have once existed is now either long erased or in a landfill somewhere in Tippecanoe County, Indiana. So you have to take my word for it when I say we were very talented. So it came to pass that once upon a Sunday school, little me heard this story that we had just read from St. Matthew's Gospel. It is a parable all about talents. We were supposed to use our talents to make more talents, and as you know by now, little me was very talented. And if I played my cards right, I might just become very, very talented. And then God would be really happy with me. Of course, like so many things I thought when I was little, such as when I was convinced that one day I would be the starting center for the Indiana Hoosiers basketball team, (laughs) I did not have this one quite right. I would come to find out that these talents are not talents like we would do in our shows. 
A talent was a unit of measure. This was an amount of money, precious metal, gold, or silver. So, maybe this parable was about using the money that God had given me, the currency that I had, and I would make more money, and then God would be happy. But that reading, confining this parable to just being about money, opens up some really funky readings of this text. For example, the unscrupulous master, reaping where he did not sow, gathering where he did not scatter seed, and the promotion of things like usury, which would have been completely out of place in the Jewish society of Jesus' day. So if the talents aren't talents, singing, dancing, running, jumping, and they aren't money talents... And what the dickens is this parable about anyway? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> to answer, however, what we need to do is expand the portion of Matthew's gospel that we are looking at this week. In essence, to all of chapter 25. So that's what you heard last week in worship, and also what you're going to hear next week. But since I wasn't here last week, and I'm not going to be here next week, I get to do this. Now this setting for this parable of the talents, is that it immediately follows another parable of Jesus, the parable of the ten bridesmaids at the beginning of Matthew 25. And that parable ends with an admonition. Keep awake, therefore, Jesus says to his hearers, to his disciples, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now the thing that Jesus is telling them to keep awake for is the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. But for now, let's look at the other end of this parable. Spoilers for next week's worship service. Now, at the end of Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about his own coming again in glory, which is a future event. This is important to note. And he uses a well-known image, at least it is well known to us, of the goats on the left and the sheep on the right in order to describe that day of judgment. And the way that the sheep and the goats are judged, the currency of their interaction with Jesus is the charges that they have, the chances they are given to care for others, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, and welcome the stranger. In essence, they are judged on their opportunities to bring about the kingdom of heaven, as St. Matthew's gospel calls it, that thing that Jesus has been talking about all chapter, even all gospel, in the here and now. And that currency, those callings of Jesus, to minister, to care for a world in need, is, I am convinced, the currency that we are dealing with when we talk about this parable of the talents. It fits if you read it back into the parable that Jesus tells. Jesus, who will be soon leaving, his crucifixion is in chapter 27, tells a story about a wealthy man who leaves, who goes off on a journey and entrusts an abundance of this currency to members of, house, of the household whom he trusts. Just as Jesus will be entrusting the ministry of the gospel to his disciples upon his death and then ascension. Then, when he returns, he rewards those who take risks with that currency because it multiplies that currency in the world. And this fits right in with all of that sheep and goats stuff from the end of Matthew 25. The sheep are rewarded because they have taken their currency, their opportunities for ministry, and they have taken that bold step to tangibly share the love of Jesus with a world so deeply in need of it. Just like those who had the five and the two talents in our gospel story today. This is all quite abstract, so what does it look like concretely? Well, in a congregation I know pretty well up in Wisconsin, it looked like seeing a hunger need in their community. And some folks from that congregation getting together and putting together a grocery bag ministry. It provides food, I think it's six times a year. No questions asked to anyone in the community who's hungry. 
Some other folks from that same church got together, pulled together a group from the whole community, and they host a community meal once a month, free of charge, to anyone who comes. Now, did the pastor come up with those ideas? No. She encouraged them. She helped facilitate a couple of meetings. She made sure people had space to use. But it was the people of God stepping out in faith, taking a risk for ministry that addressed the need of their community. Now, this can be small scale, too. In the congregation where I did my contextual education, down in the Chicago suburbs, they had a mouse problem. And one day, a guy from that congregation, his name was Joe, came up to the pastor and said, Pastor, somebody has got to do something about these mice. Pastor said, Joe, you're absolutely right. I think what you should do is go home and pray and see if the Holy Spirit has given you the charism. Now, that's a fun Greek word that means the spiritual ability to carry out a calling. The charism to keep those mice outside. I don't know how Joe's prayers went that night, but I have a pretty good idea because for the rest of the year that I served there, I never saw a mouse inside the building. Whether it is feeding their community or making sure that all of God's precious rodents stay safely homed out of doors, it is these opportunities for ministry to care for others and the world God made that is the currency in our parable today. And Jesus tells us in the parable of the great joy of God that is met with our joyful response. When we reach out for the sake of the gospel, when we take that risk of faith. But what then of the one who is given the single talent? Well, Matthew 25 tells us that they don't act using the talent that they are given. This servant buries the talent in the ground, and Matthew 25 also tells us why. 25, 25. So I was afraid. I was afraid. Those are probably three of the most paralyzing words in the English language. Fear is the most powerful force that can keep us from taking that step out in faith. We might fear what others will think of us. We might fear that we will lose standing in their eyes. We might fear that our efforts will come to naught, that we won't succeed. We might fear that our failure will disappoint others. We might fear that our failure will disappoint God. We might fear the consequences of that disappointment. And yet what we read in 1 Thessalonians today tells us quite bluntly, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for attaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We need not fear the wrath of God in the pursuit of these opportunities for ministry, because God in Christ holds us tight in peace, grace, love, and salvation. But we can still get paralyzed by fear. We might feel that we're surrounded by people who have taken the currency given to them, those opportunities for service and ministry, taken that risk, stepped out in faith, and we might fear that our results might not be the same. Yet we are encouraged to act, knowing that salvation, the end of all things, is in the hands of God. Now, this same thing happened during the Reformation. Martin Luther's friend and collaborator, Philip Melanchthon, was still in Wittenberg when Luther had gone into hiding after being declared an outlaw at the Diet of Worms. And in Wittenberg, Melanchthon was back there trying to run the whole Reformation enterprise. And he was scared. He was fearful. He was afraid that he would mess up all that the reformers had done. So he froze up. He was worried that in his attempts to do good, he might inadvertently sin against God and his neighbor. 
Well, word of this got back to Luther, and Luther wanted to encourage his friends, so he wrote him a letter, which ended with the very famous exhortation. It goes like this. Sin boldly, he said. Be a sinner. But believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. For he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. Luther, in essence, is saying to his friend, do something. Act in faith. Preach the gospel. Live the gospel. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Shelter the homeless. God has control of the rest. So perhaps the story that Jesus tells today isn't about how talented we are. And it isn't just about the ways that we use the money that God has given us. It's more broad than that. It's about the opportunities and callings to ministry that God has given you, us, the church, the disciples of Jesus in every time and place. The calling that we have is clear. Act in faith on those opportunities and callings to ministry that God has put in your life. Care for others and the world God made, as we promised to do in holy baptism. God will take it from there. Thanks be to God. Amen.